Hello, everyone. How are you today? I uh, pray that you're ready to hear the Word of God. Um, I know you are because that's why you're here. And you come with an expectation that the Word of God will be preached, and I have an expectation for myself that I will preach it. And I want to ask that uh, you join me right now in prayer before I read from the scriptures and ask for God's blessing. Father, we are thankful um, for just the time that you give us to sing, to fellowship with one another, to also hear your word. I pray that you help me to communicate them, that your people will be edified, and if there's someone in our midst who really doesn't know you as Savior, that their eyes would be open, that they would turn to the cross and be saved. In Christ's name, amen. Now, what I'd like to do, if you turn with me to John chapter 19, John 19, and there is our text for this morning. The title of the message is The Crown in the Cross. The crown and the cross, as you see there in your bulletin, but John 19. I think it's appropriate that you, we hear the scripture read. Um, the text for us this morning is verses 16 to 30. And just follow with me as I read it, as we look at the crucifixion. So he then handed him over to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, it was written, Jesus, the Nazarene, king of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests and the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his sisters, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received this sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The crown and the cross. Uh, that is our message for this afternoon. And the cross was symbolic of shame and agony and death in Jesus' time. 
I mean, this horrifying means of death probably originated with the Phoenicians, and it was widespread in use, especially within the Roman Empire. And of course, you may have heard before, it was so degrading as a means of death that no Roman citizen could be executed by crucifixion. Paul, a Roman citizen, was beheaded, an instant form of death. Jesus, a Roman subject, was crucified, suffering in one sense beyond human imagination. Yet in the midst of this explanation of Jesus' crucifixion, John has a purpose in mind. John wants to show how Jesus Christ is in fact God in human flesh. He wants us to see that there is a crown in the cross. The sole purpose of Job of John's book is to put forth Jesus Christ as the Son of God, God in human flesh dwelling among men, and if men would believe in him, they would have life. They can be saved. And in this text before us, I want us to identify, and there are four specific ways depicted in this passage that the cross glorifies Jesus Christ as God. Four specific ways. And I'll give them to you now before we work our way through the passage. Number one is we will note how there is a specific fulfillment of prophecy. Specific fulfillment of prophecy. The plan, the divine plan of God is unfolding in the cross. There is also another way that you see this. There is the statement of the superscription. There's a statement which we read earlier, uh, here is the king of the Jews. That's the second way. There's a third way that we will see that this glorifies Jesus Christ as God, the demonstration of his selfless love, selfless love on the cross as he is agonizing in pain. And then fourthly, we'll notice the supernatural knowledge and control even in the midst of crucifixion, Jesus demonstrates supernatural knowledge and control. So these four ways, these four depictions of this passage point us in a way that glorifies Jesus Christ as God in human flesh, a Savior beyond saviors, accomplishing what no one could accomplish accomplishing what no man can accomplish for himself. First, the specific fulfillment of prophecy. Actually, if we were to consider the life of Jesus Christ and prophetic fulfillment, there are 332 prophecies fulfilled in his life. 332. But in this specific text, we want to consider several of them. Look at John 19, 16, and it says, So he was handed over to them to be crucified. This is a fulfillment of Isaiah 53 and 7. Because in Isaiah 53 and 7, it says, He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. He was brought to slaughter. Jesus Christ, here in this narrative, we see... God's word being fulfilled prophetically. Um, you can drive cattle, but you don't drive sheep. You lead sheep. He was led away. That's the significance of Jesus Christ being led rather than dragged or driven to execution. Historians clearly tell us that it was customary for victims, they would have to be driven or dragged to crucifixion to the crucifixion site because of the terror. They knew what was awaiting them. They would have seen someone crucified before. They would have heard stories of the agony associated with crucifixion. And so they would have to be dragged to that point, driven, at times beaten along the way, picked up again and beaten. But this is not so with Jesus Christ. He is led no one has to drag him. No one has to beat him. No one has to drag him along the way because he is going of his own accord. He is doing this willingly. 
no resistance whatsoever. So that's why he is like a, a lamb that is led to slaughter. He is not driven because there is something else that drives Jesus Christ. He is driven by his own will. He is driven by an affection for his Father. He is driven by his own glory that he would fulfill God's word. What else do we see fulfilled in this passage? Verse 17, he would suffer outside the city. Verse 17, so they took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross and going to the place of a skull. All the Old Testament offerings and repeated sacrifices were pictures of Jesus' final sacrifice. And in particular, uh, the sin offering. The sin offerings in the Old Testament had to be taken outside the camp. And we see that in Exodus 29. You see it in, in Leviticus 4 and Leviticus 16. It would take place outside the camp. And so with Jesus Christ, it is outside of Jerusalem because now he represents that sin offering, an offering given for his chosen people. Turn with me to the writer of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 13, in Hebrews 13, and then in verse 11, it's confirming this fulfillment in Hebrews 13, 11, and it tells us this, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. God in his precision is fulfilling his word through Jesus Christ, not only is he led like a lamb, according to Isaiah, but he would suffer outside the gate. Now, there's much that one could say here, and if I were doing a full exposition of John's gospel, um, we could talk about the place of the skull historically, uh, what is the location, what are the proposed locations of it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. I've been to the locations. I've heard some of the theories. I have an opinion. Overall, it doesn't matter. Here is the reality that Jesus Christ suffered. Amen? The exact location which people have spent uh, much effort to discover, uh, I think one is reasonable over the other. It doesn't matter in the end. Jesus Christ would suffer greatly for his people outside the gate. Verse 18, we see, go back to John 19, verse 18, we see another fulfillment of Scripture, prophecy unfolding. John 19, verse 18, the fact that he would be crucified. You say, well, that's self-evident, but we have to remember this is a fulfillment of prophecy right before us in these words. In Numbers 21, 6 through 9, is clearly a type of Jesus Christ's death. What had happened in that context, the Israelites had been sinning, and the Lord sent poisonous snakes to bite them. And what occurred? Upon their admission of their sin, God instructed Moses to do what? He made a bronze serpent, and he put it on a pole, and he said all those who would look here by faith would be healed. And that's a beautiful type of Jesus Christ. And if you were to think today, when you think about the symbol for medicine, what is it? It is that serpent that is on a pole because you think just the opposite. Wait, wait a minute, that's something that can kill. But no, there is a recognition even in the medical industry of taking us back to Deuteronomy and say this is a point of healing. And it was healing for them as they would look in faith. And so Christ is that. It is indeed a type. Because if you go back to John chapter 3, 
Jesus Christ makes it incredibly clear in John chapter 3 that what was spoken of in Deuteronomy 21, 6 through 9, was in fact a vision, um, a foretelling of my life and me giving of myself. In John chapter 3, 14 and 15, Christ himself says, As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, or serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. And just as the people during the days of numbers, uh, as it was written, looked in faith, so they were healed. And so anyone that looks in faith today is healed. In Psalm 22, I read it earlier, um, Psalm 22, 14 through 16 are depictions of this crucifixion. The same thing is true of Isaiah 53 and 2, depictions of Christ being crucified. If we go back to John chapter 19, also, what else is fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ on this cross? He would be numbered with transgressors. Numbered with transgressors. In verse 18, it communicates as well in John's gospel. It says, and with him, two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Um, Isaiah 53.9 says that, and he made his grave with the wicked. Isaiah 53.12 says, and he was numbered with transgressors. And here he is in this crucifixion, one on the left and one on the right. And what's beautiful even about the crucifixion itself, and here's another example of the crown being in the cross, we know the story that initially both are mocking Jesus Christ, but something happens according to Luke's um, account of it that one comes to grips. And that's an act of grace even in the midst of mocking the Son of God that one comes to grips with his life, and then he does what? He rebukes the other. And that wonderful story, those wonderful words, where he says to Jesus Christ, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what were the words of Jesus Christ? Today, when did he say? When was it going to happen? Today you shall be with me in paradise. Sinners. This is why he came, to save sinners. He would be numbered with transgressors. He would be led to slaughter. He would suffer outside the city. But there is another fulfillment in this crucifixion. Verses 23 and 24 of John 19. The soldiers and his garments in verse 23 says, Then the soldiers... When he had been crucified, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, and a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless and woven in one piece, and they declared, let us not tear it, but they cast lots for it. This is Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So now depicted here in the life of Jesus Christ. Now, when you think about Christ and these four main elements of Jesus' clothing, his shoes, his belt, his headdress, and his outer cloak, and underneath this would have been his inner tunic, and they, they, they gamble for it. Why? Because it was in one piece. Why is that important? Um, if we go back to the Old Testament, the garment of the high priest had to be without seam. Uh, and what did that represent? It represented purity. And in one sense, Jesus here, it, it is representing, here I am acting as a high priest. I'm standing in the gap between you and God. But unlike the high priest who would offer up a sacrifice, Jesus, and Christ, Jesus Christ is the very sacrifice. He is making atonement with his very own life, not offering up a life. He is that life that he has given. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. 
Go back to Hebrews 9 with me again. And what is communicated here in Hebrews 9 in verse 11 Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. So I skipped right past it there. And it says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and of calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and of bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What a beautiful statement. How much more if all of these animals in the past offered some cleansing, temporary though it may be, how much more will Christ do for you what they could not? So this seam representing purity, seamless, one piece is gambled for, fulfilling prophecy. So we see that he was numbered. We see that he was led to slaughter. He was crucified. He suffers outside the city. His garments are gambled for. But here is something else we notice in verses 19 to 22. Secondly, this superscription, the statement that is here. It is important in this message that here is God, a very God, dying for his people. In verse 19 of John 19, it says what? Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was, was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. And the placket was normally there to state the crime of the criminal. But here it's a statement to the world of Jesus Christ's deity to the world. Here is the crown that is in the cross. And Jesus had told Pilate that indeed he was a king. In chapter 12, verse 13, he says, Indeed I am a king, and I have come for this purpose. Now, Pilate is most likely making this statement in one sense as a dig against the Jews, almost to say, here is your king. What sort of mighty king do you have? The Roman mighty power has taken your king, and it has crucified it. And just as your king is crucified, if you dare think that you can stand up against us, you have the same lot. But little does Pilate know that this is a design plan from eternity being fulfilled by his hands, although his hands are blood stains, regardless of the fact you remember in John's account that he would go and wash his hands thinking that he is free of his blood. He is not. He did not heed the, the wise counsel of his wife have nothing to do with this man. He heard the words that says, if you are a friend of this man, then you are not a friend of Caesar. Wash his hands though as may, he is still guilty of his sin. Because the only friend, here is the thing about the gospel, the only washing that can cleanse us of our sins is what we see in this passage is the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Nothing else. Nothing else will do. So, in fact, he is a savior. The placard is true. This is the king of the Jews. And every knee, according to Philippians chapter 2, every knee and every tongue will bow down to Jesus Christ and recognize him as Lord, see him as king of kings and lord of lords. Here's a third consideration and this crown in the cross, his selfless love that is demonstrated. Look at John 19, 25 to 27, his selfless love. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. 
But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of, wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. What's the significance of this? Well, I would say that perhaps one of the greatest manifestations even of his deity on the cross was his love and concern for others while he is going through this excruciating pain. And we must remind ourselves that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. He did not cloak himself from the pain of his brutalizing death. He did not cloak himself from the pain of being slapped in the face. He did not cloak himself from the, the weariness of being up under this mock um, trial the night before, of, of walking through the city, of going up to Golgotha. He did not cloak himself from the brutality that he faced, which was Roman crucifixion. It's excruciating pain for him. But even in that moment, what does he do? He looks out, and it's woman. Why does he use this term? It's a, a term of respect, but in one sense, it's, it's implying some sense of separation. Why separation? It's saying our relationship is changing. I won't be there any longer as a son by your side, but I am going to take care of you. Here is Christ thinking of others in the midst of, of his difficulty. And now, in one sense, what is happening in this transition, I am most certainly your Savior, not just your Son. Deity manifesting itself in this selfish love for others around him. And you think about the cross itself, and most likely Christ is only uh, about three feet off the ground, and they would be standing at his feet so they would clearly hear his voice as he is making this statement to his mother and making sure that she would be taken care of. What boundless love he has. And this is why the scripture tells us even of his love that the psalmist speaks about this love of Yahweh as a love that is everlasting. And this is why the psalmist says time and time again, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love and kindness is, in fact, everlasting. Here's a fourth reason that Jesus Christ is glorified through the cross, that there is a crown in the cross, his supernatural knowledge and control. Verses 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. And what happens? They give him the wine. And he makes the statement that should be dear to every believer's heart, it is finished. And he bows his head. These words, it is finished. He bowed his head. He gave up his spirit. And let me give you some statements, several statements that I want to give you. And they all start with Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all because. The first one is this. Jesus paid it all because his statement or his death is a statement of his deity. His death is a statement of his deity. Um, now that may trouble some. You say, wait a minute. His death is a statement of his deity? It should actually communicate just the opposite. Yes. For the Jew, for him to die, it is in fact um, a stumbling block. And this is what Paul says to the Jew. It's a stumbling block. Why is it a stumbling block? Because for them, wait a minute, that makes no sense. A statement of his deity it's a stumbling block to the Jew because they say, no, the Messiah, he is going to be the great conqueror. He will deliver us from all of our, our evil oppressors. How can the Messiah possibly die? And that's why it's a stumbling block to them. 
And to the Greek, it is foolishness. So the Greek says, no, no, our gods do not die at the hands of mortals. No, that, that is foolishness to us. That is not possible. But this is a beautiful statement of deity because here it is only God who can and has prescribed this plan that is set from eternity that he would give his only begotten son, that he would die for sinners. And now on this excruciating moment of the cross, he lays down his life. His word is being fulfilled. All the details. 332 prophecies fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. And we see only a sampling of them right here on the cross itself. It's a demonstration of deity. His absolute knowledge and control of all things. Christ knows here is that moment now. All is accomplished. Now, I'm, I'm diving into something right now. <laughs> because what I'm communicating to you is this. What was that moment? Why didn't it happen in the, the first second of the crucifixion? Why not a minute into the crucifixion? Why at that moment? Somehow in the divine mind, when all the sin of all mankind and all his chosen people are placed upon him, Christ says, it is accomplished. I mean, it's difficult. You can't grasp that. The human mind cannot grasp that. It's not meant to grasp it. It's not possible to grasp that. I mean, if you were to think of your own life individually, and if you were to give an account of your own life and go through your own life and say all the times that I can remember that I have sinned against the Lord, and that is heaped upon him. And if we take everyone in this room and everything that you can remember that is heaped upon him, and we can take every saint throughout history and into the future, and all of that is heaped upon Jesus Christ in that moment, and he says, it is finished. I've taken on all the sin of all my chosen people from the past and into eternity. The weight of it all. I ask you a question uh, this afternoon. Have you ever, and I would say actually it should be, you should have if you're a Christian, you should have this experience if you're a Christian where you have felt the weight of your sin and you're saddened by it and you're burdened by it and you wonder, why did I do that again? Why did I think that? Why did I have that attitude? And it can weigh upon you. And what you must do is go to the Lord and you cast it upon him freshly, if you will, and that burden is taken away. Imagine that weight that we feel that in one sense is minuscule compared to what Christ has taken on. And the thing about us is this. We go back to the basics of understanding the gospel is we felt it because we deserved it. <laughs> and we felt it because we did it. And we felt it because we thought it. And we felt it because we acted in such a way but Christ is an innocent, spotless Lamb of God that has taken on that sin. But he has a knowledge to say at that right moment, it is finished. It is done. Justice has been satisfied. And what's interesting about it, even before he makes this, which is really the sixth phrase that he utters from the cross, it is finished to tell us that this wine was given to him. Even the wine is a fulfillment of prophecy. The wine is a pre preparation for his voice to cry out these words. Jesus paid it all in this way. Secondly, Jesus paid it all because his death communicated the completion of a life work. The word, it is finished, or to tell us conveys only half the meaning. Yes, it is a sense of completion. It means to bring to an end, to finish, to complete something. True. But it also means the idea that you're carrying out the will of something or the obligation of someone. And see, this was Christ's work of redemption. 
not only just to complete a task, but it's to fulfill, to carry out the will or obligation of something or someone. And we know that Christ was carrying out the will of his Father. It was his Father's will that he died. It is Father's will that he would come and give his life as a ransom for many. And this is why Jesus Christ said this, I always do the things that are pleasing to him, to his Father. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? So to tell us that, yes, it is finished, the, the work itself is done, but it's in the context of saying, I have completed my Father's will that I come and that I die. The debt is paid. And the word also carries this idea of a payment. It was used as a payment for rent or a poll tax. It would be stamped to Telestai. And all of us had an infinite debt that only Christ could pay. And this is why in the book of Colossians it says that what did Christ do? He took away the certificate of debt which was hostile towards us. Um, we have a debt on our home. One debt will be paid off. And uh, I'm going to have a grand party when that takes place, I think. And I make the payment um, often, you know, ahead of time. I make the payment and we chip away at it and we chip away at it. Um, but nonetheless, it's there. But it's not hostile towards me. It's not. It's not hostile. It causes no separation for me. I work, I earn, I pay. I work, I earn, and I pay. No hostility there whatsoever. But friend, the debt of your sin. Paul says it was hostile towards you. Why? Because if that debt is unpaid, there is an eternal separation between you and the living God. If that debt is unpaid, it means a life of suffering. And if, as Jesus Christ said, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a debt. But Christ, through these words, it is finished, says, is paid for. What you could not pay, I have paid. And all of us, I'm sure that whatever debt we have, perhaps presently, is some benefactor came along and says, friend, um, I'm going to take care of your debt. Would you thank that person? I would think so. If not, you're incredibly rude. You would thank that person. Thank you so much. And they say, friend, I just heard that you had this debt. And I've just come into this great sum of money, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it all. I decided that I would just pay your debt. Thank you, friend, for that. I appreciate it. Yes. Wonderful story if it could happen that way. Most likely not. Most likely not. But the thing about Christianity is this. It is not coming and saying, friend, it's according to uh, Romans chapter 5, Romans 5 says, he's coming and says, you are helpless, I will pay your debt. It's coming and says, you are ungodly, and I will pay your debt. It's Christ coming and says, you are a sinner, and I will pay your debt. And in a most pronounced way, he is saying, I'm coming to you in Romans 5, and I come to you as an enemy, and I pay your debt. That's the beauty of the gospel, is it not? It's wonderful as he comes and says, well, friend, you've been so obedient and you've been so worshipful and you've been so kind to others around you and you have done nothing but laud and praise my name. Let me pay your debt. No, it is not that. All we like sheep were what? Gone astray. And he pays our debt. Enemies of God and he pays it. Sinners, ungodly and helpless, and he pays it. That's the beauty of the gospel. So when he says it is finished, think about it in a certain context. 
it's the completion of a work. Look at some text with me. Go back to John chapter 10. It's the final act of this self-offering. God had given him a work to accomplish, and Jesus Christ accomplishes it. This is what we see here. John 10, 18, and it says, No one has taken it from me. I lay it down in my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my, what does he say? From my Father. From my Father. Look at John 13. John 13, verse 3. Jesus says here, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. And when would he go back to God? Once he is crucified and then he raises himself again from the dead. Look at John 14. No, to tell us that, it means he is fulfilling the Father's will. To tell us that, he is paying a debt for us. John 14, 31 and it says, but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father has commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. And of course, the context of what going, now he's going closer to the cross where he would give his life as a ransom for many. John 17 and 4. He says, I glorified you on the earth, speaking to his Father, having accomplished the work which you had given me to do. I prepared these men to take on this ministry, and now there is another step, which is that ultimate, I would give my life as a ransom. Go back to John chapter 4. Turn back, and I uh, did it in that order for a reason. Go back to John chapter 4, and then... It says in verse 31, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? They they don't understand. And that happened often, correct? Verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That is a meal for every Christian to dine on, is it not? (laughs) To fulfill God's word. You know, there's a great satisfaction when we accomplish something, especially if it's something that's significant. And there's even greater, I think, satisfaction or motivation even when we accomplish something that's eternal and when it's motivated by love. And so Jesus Christ is motivated by love to do his Father's will. Notice what again what he says in 1431. I love the Father. I do exactly as he had commanded me to do. Let us go. Let us go. And this is in part, I think, why Paul even says that the love of Christ controls us. Why does Paul give of of his life so much? Why is he willing to be Uh, brutalized? Why is he willing to be shipwrecked? Why is he willing to be misunderstood? Why is he willing to be beaten? Because the love of Christ controls me. And so with us, it must be the same. Um, You know, this is a wonderful Christmas message, I think. It's a wonderful Easter message. It's a wonderful Thanksgiving message. It's a wonderful March message. It's a wonderful September message. It's a wonderful any Sunday message, the cross of Jesus Christ. We should be reminded of it. Um, Some see this as a Black Friday, but it's not that at all. It's uh, a crown. It's in the cross itself. It's not a Black Friday. That's an interesting term itself, Black Friday. And, um, you know, that would, the day after Thanksgiving called Black Friday. Do you know the, the history behind that word? Very interesting. Um, listen to this. Language guru Ben Zimmer tracks down what he believes is the source of the phrase Black Friday. It originated actually in the 1960s in Philadelphia. Traffic was so bad the day after Thanksgiving 
that police officers had to work 12-hour shift. So they gave that day a negative word, a memorable word. They called it what? Black Friday. Man, traffic was terrible. We're working these 12-hour shifts. People are honking. They're shouting at us. Um, not good. And then the term was picked up on in 1966 by an Earl Affelbaum, a dealer in rare stamps. In his ad, he said, Black Friday is a name which he used that the police department in Philadelphia came up with. Get your deals here on Black Friday. So if you were to look at the history, the history behind it is a horrible day. The police officers were saying, I don't want to remember that day. I don't want to repeat it again. And sometimes we use these terms and we don't even know the history behind it. Sometimes it's innocent. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's just very neutral, if you will. Sometimes people think about the cross as a black day. But it was both. It was both. It was horrible. One can't even imagine a father giving their son in this way. But the father did. It's a horrible day. But it was the greatest day ever. Because on that cross, Jesus Christ would display that in fact, I am the God-man come to give my life as a ransom for many. It is Jesus Christ saying, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. Not a Black Friday. It was a glorious Friday. It was a glorious day that Jesus Christ would give his life. Jesus paid it all because his death was a victory, not a defeat. The crucifixion did not thwart the plans of God. It was a fulfillment of his plans. This is what we've already seen from just a few um, prophetic verses. It fulfilled that plan. The scripture tells us that so very clearly. The song goes, Jesus paid it all. It is not Jesus lost it all. No, he paid it all, and he gained all for the glory of God. He gained redemption that he would be glorified. Friends, what we must think often is this. What we must think often is this. Why does God save? Why does he save anyone? A God who has no need in himself. Why are we here today gathered? Why are you here to hear the word of God? Why will you reflect on Christ and his death? This should cause some sense of wonder in you. Insignificant individuals the vastness of the universe itself. You look into the heavens and you say, this God created all things just in a moment. Let it be. And it was. This morning I got up as I traditionally do when I'm going to preach. I go on my preaching walk as I, as I call it. And I was out and it was beautiful. And it was beautiful how the dew was on the ground and the sun was coming over the mountains and was hitting it. And I was able to see St. Helens over here in this direction. And I saw Hood in this direction. And the way the light was hitting Hood was different because it, there was just a glow about it. And I love seeing that. I'm thinking, my God created this just like that. God has no need in himself. None. Errant um, theologians devoid of real truth would say that somehow God saved because there is some need in God. No, my friends, there is that beautiful, eternal, Trinitarian love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Perfect love. Why have creatures now? Because he decides, I want to do it to glorify myself. Now, those words for us are dangerous words. When we say, I'm doing it to my own glory. There have been men and women throughout history who have done it, and they found out on the wrong end of God's wrath. Have they not? There was one, remember Nebuchadnezzar? When he went out and looked at all of his kingdom, and what did he say? Look at my glory, which all my hands have made. Well, seven years later, he got the point, did he not? <laughs> no. But God is the only one that can say, I do it for my own glory, 
because I choose to. And you should be thankful that he chooses to use you and to save you for his glory. The whole point of our salvation, that we live in such a way to glorify God. Jesus Christ, when he died, he died as a victor, not in defeat. Crown, pressed upon his head, into his brow. Blood is coming down. No pearls, no diamonds, no rubies, no sapphires, no emeralds in this crown. But it was a crown that he gave his life as a ransom for many. Out of love for his father, out of love for his sheep, and out of love for his own glory. And if you can think about these things often and not be stirred in your soul, I would be concerned. That's the one thing about, you know, preaching you, know, you prepare and you go over the notes and you're circling and I have my own system. I circle certain words and I underline things so I can, I can glance and I know my next thoughts and I see my words that I need to speak. And so you go over it again and you look at it again. And you get up in the morning, you go for a walk and you think about these things. And then I met with the brothers earlier. Then I, I looked over it again and I'm reading through it. Then I read from Psalm 22. Then I read Psalm 19 and I read it again. Sometimes it gets to be too much. Because this is my Savior. I'm not just giving you a historical account. This is not just a word study. This is not just a theological discourse. This is me talking about my Savior to you, and I pray God that He is your Savior. And you must see that there's a crown in this cross. That he would give his life as a ransom for you. He was a victor. It is not defeat. It was... Oh, Jesus paid it all. Because his death was an act of his will. It was an act of his will. Notice what it says, he gave up. No one had taken his life. It gave up is a voluntary act, it's obvious. Luke 23, 46 lets us know that these words, he, his final words, it was a quotation from Psalm 31 and 5 when he says, If Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He gave up his life for us. Voluntary, an act of his will, depicting a great act of love. I would say this Jesus paid it all because his death was an act of trust. He bowed his head unto death. Interesting enough, uh, one old New Testament scholar, Beasley Murray, cites a comment of origin concerning Christ's death, and it was sobering. And he quotes Origen by saying this, Jesus bent the head and took his departure in the act of resting, as it were, on the lap of the Father who could cherish it and strengthen it in his bosom. I like that image. Uh, it's always wonderful, especially when... Um, in, in services, young kids are with us or babies are with us, and you look out and sometimes you see that little kid and what are they doing? They're leaning back on mom or dad. It's that sense of rest. You know, they've done well. 
you know, they've done well, they've made it to an hour, an hour and a half, they're like, I'm not sure if I can make it. And they lean over on dad or mom. And that's the picture that Origen was sort of saying. Here is Jesus Christ, this son that's been given by the father, and he bows down his head, and he commits his spirit to his father. He's resting. The script even tells that he rested. He rested now so that we could have rest, amen? And we could enter into that rest. Let me close my message this way. What, how should we respond to this? I mean, individually, you must make your own decision how you should respond to this message. How should you respond to Jesus Christ giving his life as a ransom for many? How do you respond as a Christian because Christ died such a horrible death? How do you respond and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? We have to remind ourselves when we think about the cross that there are many ways that Jesus could have died. So even, even the fact that Christ comes during the time of this Roman Empire, and this would be the, the, the way in which Romans would crucify criminals, that is a part of a, of a specific plan that says, yes, my son will give his life, but he will give it under this horrible act of crucifixion. I mean, perhaps Christ comes during a different time and it just would have been death just by um, gunfire. Aim, fire, and shoot right to the heart and he's dead. Maybe he comes in a different time. It's a time when it's just guillotine and just one mark and, and then he's gone. Sort of like um, Paul does. His head is taken off because he's a Roman citizen. Or maybe he comes to a different time and it's lethal injection, and, and that's how criminals are taken care of at that time. But he doesn't. In God's divine plan, he comes during the Roman Empire at this time where he would be crucified, he would be flogged, he would be beaten, he would be spat upon, a horrible death. He would hang on a tree because it is fulfilling what God had already said, that if I be lifted up. So it couldn't be crucifixion because... Or it had to be crucifixion because Moses lifted up the serpent. Couldn't be a guillotine because Moses lifted up a serpent and God's word is true throughout, is it not? It had to be this way. He had to hang above the earth, about so high. He had to have nails. His bones could not be broken. He had to be stabbed in the side. God's word is being fulfilled. So what's your response? Several words. Number one, gratitude. Have gratitude. Gratitude. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's another word? I'll say this. Aptitude. Say aptitude. Yes, learn. Grow in your aptitude. Grow in your understanding of the cross. Grow in your understanding of your faith. Latitude. What do you mean by that? What is the direction of your life? Where is it going? Are you striving? Are you being more like Christ? The direction of my life is to follow him more. I'm thinking about Philippians 3, that I'm striving towards that mark or towards that upward call. Here's another word for you. Let's, let's keep with that sequence, magnitude. Magnitude, the sense of what is really worth, what are the things that are worth it in life? I, I have to have an enlarged view of God. And if I have an enlarged view of God, I put things in perspective and I say that all these treasures of the world are worthless. I want Christ. The last word is this, Attitude. Thoroughly biblical, Philippians chapter 2, have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. And what did he do? Humbled himself to the point of death. And I love how Paul says it, even death on a cross. Even death on a cross. Father, we thank you for... These words, thank you for your great sacrifice. 
to give your great son that we would have such a great salvation. In Christ's name, amen.